is changing I'm so glad that I've one more time I've never been the same and I've never been the same since Jesus saved me now I have the power of God within 
Day by day I know my life is changing I'm so glad that I've been born again Amen. Thank you for coming out to Sunday School this morning. We're going to continue our series with Pastor Greg on Memorial Stones. There's Sunday School for all ages, also Spanish-speaking Sunday School as well. And we'll open in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you're going to do. God, we open our hearts for what you have to say, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, and good to see you all. If you have your Bibles, turn to... Joshua chapter 4, we are continuing our series uh, on memorial stones. We have this lesson and three more, and then we'll bring it to a close. Um, finally, and so let's get our main verse, Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, so we're going to begin, uh, we're going to look at a couple of things today. I'm telling the, uh, the story of our church and our fellowship. We're looking at history and we're learning lessons along the way. Many of these are uh, great lessons. We're, we're going to get to something good in a bit. But I'm also telling some dark stories. I'm telling some painful periods in our uh, history. And so we're going to talk today about the split of 2000 in our uh, 53, almost 54 year history in our fellowship. We have had what we, a few splits. These are people that rebel and split off from us. We've already looked at the, the first one, which was 1990. Now we're going to look at the split of 2000. And then we'll look briefly at one in Australia that was in 2009. So let's look at the split of 2000. We, we talked before and I told you how in 1990 we had a, a group of men uh, rise up. Actually, they were trying to take over or oust Pastor Mitchell. That didn't succeed. But they left us and took about 100 churches and I, I want to emphasize to you how much that was a surprise to Pastor Mitchell and basically everyone. We had never had anyone leave like that. And uh, so we, Pastor Mitchell was not expecting it. No one dreamed that that could be possible. The split of 2000 that we're going to talk about was not like that at all. If you had half a brain, as Dad used to say, if you were even mildly astute, you could see this one coming a long way off. It was a slow motion train wreck. And so what happened is we, we had men that had been saved uh, in our church. We had men that had been discipled. Our method of training pastors is not Bible school. It's training in-house through the process, the biblical process of discipleship. So you had people that were saved they owed their salvation to Pastor Mitchell and our church. They were discipled, trained for ministry. They were launched into ministry, supported financially by us, and they were entrusted with ministry. But the nature of ministry for many of these men, the early days of ministry, it often involves struggle. Not everybody who goes out the first week, they are a raging uh, success. Uh, there are difficulties, it's not going well. And so because of the struggle factor, you often have men when they first go out, they, it's, it's more natural for them to do one of two things. When you're struggling, you tend to rely on God because you're desperate for his help. You don't have any people coming or uh, you're not getting genuine conversions. You need money to survive so you are relying desperately on God. And the other factor is 
When you're struggling, it is easier to appreciate your pastor, the pastor who got you saved, the pastor who trained you for ministry, the pastor who gave you an opportunity, invested money, gives you advice when you're struggling. And so uh, it is a natural thing that you are appreciative of the one who did those things for you. The problem is that some of these men began to succeed. They began to succeed numerically. Now they're no longer struggling with no people in their church. Some of them had sizable churches. No longer are they struggling to pay the rent and how are we going to eat. Some of them now had large resources uh, coming in and we would call that, and I'm using the term loosely, we could call that success. They had attention. Many of these men that we're going to talk about, people respected them because they had done a good job and they were helping uh, people. Uh, people asked them to come to their church, their nation, and preach for them. People asked them for advice. So naturally, that brings attention. Many of these men, they could travel. It's, it's quite uh, unique in our fellowship because we are a fellowship of churches. Uh, a pastor, you don't have to be in the ministry very long be, before you can go travel overseas to other nations and uh, many times they were preaching to large crowds and people are saying nice things to them and about them. It is in success that some people come in danger. Success is dangerous for some people. Let's read 2 Chronicles 26, 15. So his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped till he beca uh, became strong. Okay, until he became strong. So this is Uzziah crying out, Oh God, you've got to help me. We've got enemies who want to kill us. And so God helped. And the Bible said, until he became strong, and that's when he started being in danger, started getting into trouble. This is one of the, the great difficulties that people have is having a correct perspective when you succeed. Okay, let's get a, a little perspective before we get into the details of this. If you succeed at anything in life, it's all because of God. Do you understand this? It is all because of God. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Who's, who says you are better than others? What do you have that was not given to you? And if it was given to you, why do you brag as if it did not, you did not receive it as a gift? Okay, the Bible says everything we have that is good comes from God. You say, yeah, but I worked hard. Who gives you the, the strength to work hard? Yeah, but I'm really smart. And who made you smart? Right? It all comes from God. So, so this, this text is fascinating. Why do you brag as though you didn't receive it? It all comes from God. That's a healthy perspective in life. That doesn't mean that you are worthless and you did nothing, but it all comes from God. Perspective number two, if you succeed, now we're talking in the things of God. If you succeed in part, it is because of your pastor, right? So these men now, their churches are growing. They're getting money. They're getting attention. People are saying nice things, but their pastor had something to do with that. Shepherd is what the word pastor literally means. Shepherd is the one who guided into salvation, guided into ministry, guided into the place where they are. Joshua 1, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Okay, this is, this is actually how all of God's kingdom works. The inheritance is something good that God has planned for your life. But God says, Joshua, Joshua as the leader or the man of God, the people enter their inheritance through a man of God. He helps. You have something to do with it. You have to lay hold of God. Yes, yes, yes. But in part, it's because of man of God. And the third thing now we're talking about 
uh, these men who are uh, pastoring and succeeding, in part it is because of the fellowship, the greater group. Philemon, verse 23 and 24. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. Okay, now here is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, he must have had it going on. He must have been a brilliant man. He wrote most of the New Testament. He had uh, miracle ministry. He pioneered, he established. He wrote most of the New Testament. And yet when he writes, he says... My fellow laborers. In other words, he didn't just say, I, the Apostle Paul, I have got it going on. Did I tell you how I was caught up to heaven? That's not what he says. He says, I have fellow laborers. They're with me. We do this together. Okay, that is a healthy perspective. Now, here is a very important lesson you can file this away for yourself later on the lesson we need to look at is the danger of pride first chronicles or second chronicles 26 16 but when he was strong in his heart and was his heart was lifted up to his destruction okay this is talking about uzziah we read before he was marvelously helped till he was strong, and now this is the follow-up verse, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. The word pride literally means to be lifted up to his destruction. You know what's very, very sad in life is that few people can survive success. Hey, there's an old saying is that for every uh, hundred uh, people that can survive adversity, only one can survive success. And that's a shame because we need people to succeed. Here is the problem now. We're going to talk about how this affected these men who are succeeding all because of God, partly because of your pastor, partly because of the fellowship at large. We start to take credit for what God has done. We start to take credit for what others have done for us. This was Moses. The Bible said that his destiny changed when he came. He strikes the rock and he says, must we bring water from the rock? Any of you, have you ever been able to get water out of a rock? Try that when you get home. You got any in the garden? Go see how well you do. Moses, <laughs> that's pretty, must we bring water out of the rock? You're taking credit for what only God can do. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Who says you are better than others? What do you have that was not given to you? And if it was given to you, why do you brag as if you did not receive it as a gift? Okay, and this now is that verse repeated is here is the problem in pride. Why are you taking credit for what God has given you? Why do you take credit for what other people Gave you, and here was the, here's the problem. We had a number of pastors. I, I wish these were, I wish I was telling you about, you know, horrible gangster criminals. They weren't. They were pastors who started to become inflated with pride. Two things. The word pride, I, I pointed out, one meaning of it means to be lifted up. Proud people think they are above. So the two Ugly sides of pride, number one, people who think they're above start to despise, which is looked down on as being lesser. They despise other people. And unfortunately, the second part of pride, they start to despise spiritual authority. In this case, these men started to despise their own pastor. Pastor Mitchell, 2 Chronicles 26, 19. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. Okay, here is Uzziah. Now is the outflow. We said he was strong and, uh, he, and he was helped until he was strong. Then the Bible says he was lifted up 
to his destruction, and this is how it manifests. He was angry with the priests. He was angry with the men of God. <laughs> God appointed them. He put them in place, and so now he's despising them. I can do what you do. Because that's what pride always produces. The split of 2000, so we had 1990, a number of men left. Now, in the next 10 years, there were five main leaders who went down this road of pride in, in despising. There were others that were affected, but there were five main uh, uh, leaders in this. These men, number one, they spoke despising words about others. I know because I was privy to their conversations many times. I could hear their conversations. Everyone were idiots but them. That's how they talk. These are men of God. But they look, this guy, can you believe it? Ah. Anybody ask a question, like what kind of idiot doesn't know that? They despised. They, were, they felt they were on a on a higher plane. I want to tell you, there's nothing attractive about that. That's ugly, to speak despisingly about others. They spoke despisingly about their home church. Four out of five were from this church, and when they talked about the church that got them saved, they're not in hell today because of this church. Those, you know, podunk hicks. That's how they talk. The church that invested money in them. They spoke despising about how hokey and bad their home church was. And above all else, they despised their pastor. They wouldn't be saved without Pastor Mitchell, but they despised him. One of these men never had his own pastor preach in his church for more than 10 years. He had never had Pastor Mitchell come and preach. Now, he, if, you, if you asked him, he would say it was because, you know, Pastor Mitchell offended him and he, and he was bitter. But the real issue, it was just pride. He thought that he was better than his pastor because that's what pride does. These men started separating their church, their people, their pastors. They started separating from Prescott, started separating from the fellowship. Here's a, a repeated theme you're going to hear me talk about when I talk about rebellion. Rebels lie. So a natural thing for years, people in their churches knew it's Prescott Conference will go to conference. These men started lying to their people and telling them, Pastor Mitchell does not want you to come. He doesn't want you there. No, it's, it's not for you. It's only a pastor's conference. So you're in the body. Pastor Mitchell doesn't want you to come to a pastor. That was a lie. We've explained the basis of conferences. But the point of doing that, they didn't want their people to have any connection with Pastor Mitchell, the Prescott Church, and the larger uh, fellowship. One of these men, he pastored in Yuma. He's the one who didn't have Pastor Mitchell preach for more than 10 years. Uh, a funny story that Pastor Mitchell, it's, it's funny, not in a good way, but uh, there was a healing crusade that finally he uh, deigned to attend, and that he wasn't preaching, Pastor Mitchell was preaching. One of the men in his church asked Pastor Wayman Mitchell, the founder of the fellowship and the one who sent someone to his city where he is saved now, he asked Pastor Mitchell, he said, are you still up there in Prescott pastoring? He had no idea where Pastor Mitchell was because his pastor kept his people away from them. This actually, we have the pioneer rallies. This is actually where the idea of pioneer rallies came from. Joe Campbell recognizing what these men were doing, and Pastor Mitchell recognizing this, they said, 
we need, so if they're lying and saying we shouldn't, uh, we didn't want them to come to conference, so then they said what we need is pioneer rallies outside of conferences so some of these people in the church can have a connection with the fellowship at large. These men who were pastors, they actually were some of the leaders of the fellowship, the words that they spoke were outrageous pride. Several of them, they were ones that took offerings at the conference and they would say words like, if we don't take offerings at conference, there wouldn't be any money at all. God heard those words, fortunately, and he has made sure that that is not true. A common statement that these men said was, we are the fellowship. Talk about this wonderful gathering, this miracle of what God has done. They said, we are the fellowship. It, in other words, we're the, we're the reference points. We're the reason for its existence. We are the fellowship. One leader made an absolutely outrageous statement. He said, as a matter of fact, I'm more fellowship than Pastor Mitchell. Oh, do you understand how outrageously stupid that is? The, the pride of that is outrageous. I, some of you may remember this. At conference, when these men preached in the conference, their sermons, they took shots, they attacked people. It, it, it was whatever, they delighted in just, I'm not talking about conviction and whatever, they just shot at people. And it was always a cringe. And during those, there was an ugly few years in the fellowship, coming to conference. It, it especially was horrible when you're a missionary. You're a missionary, you desperately need to come and hear good preaching. And then it's like, oh, why is he saying that? And man, that was funky. Just attacking and shooting at people. In conference, they were constantly maneuvering. They would often, many of the, most of the time, they would never sit in the service. They always would hang out at the back or outside. They would catch people, and they were trying to talk people out of doing the will of God. If they heard that someone was thinking about going overseas and becoming a missionary, they would take them aside and say, don't, don't do that, that's stupid. You'll never have that size church again and they would try to talk people out of obedience in, in doing the will of God. In the leadership meetings that we had, I explain every January we meet, the leaders of the fellowship meet, we discuss, discuss issues. Leadership was tense and it was funky because these men were obstructive. They delighted in being contrary. Whatever Pastor Mitchell said, they took the opposite position. Uh, I, I'm convinced if Jesus, uh, if Pastor Mitchell said Jesus is God in the flesh, they'd have said, no, he ain't, just to be obstructive. That's how they were. They just delight, like seventh graders that never grew up. So many people, as I said, this could be seen. A lot of people saw this and they, many people said to Pastor Mitchell, why do you put up with that? Why don't you just remove these guys? But Pastor Mitchell took the larger picture and he said some of them they have pastors and churches out if we do that if I just step in and remove them which he would have had the right to do we're going to lose many more people and many more pastors and churches who don't understand the issues than we need to probably we're going to lose people but we're trying to minimize the damage. I, dis I discussed with you before about the damage that rebellion does. But here is a lesson I want you to, to listen to. Rebels always overplay their hand. And that is a saying that Pastor Mitchell drilled into me through the years. He said, Greg, rebels will always overplay their hand. They'll go too far which will cause them to lose uh, credibility. So we had something arise, and it was called Brownsville, Pensacola. 
This was uh, the Assembly of God Church in uh, Browns, or Pensacola, Florida. They had this, what they said was revival. Christians from all over the world started flying their bizarre manifestations of various kinds. It was a, a kind of a follow-on to the laughing revival in Toronto. And so these leaders spoke well of it. Numbers of them traveled to the Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola, and they encouraged other people uh, to do this. The man who is a part of this rebellion, he was pastoring in Gallup, New Mexico, he used to be the assistant here in Prescott. He got into this and he preached around, remember what I said, rebels lie, and he, in telling of the glories of this wonderful move of God, he, began, he preached a, a sermon on the tabernacle of David and the heavy emphasis was worship, worship, worship. And, was te- and he said, when we got into that, the next Sunday, a hundred people walked through the door. I remember in Australia, they were like, and he said, a hundred people. It was a lie. The Assembly of God in Gallup, New Mexico had a huge church split and a hundred members of the Assembly of God walked in the doors. He lied. And as easy as the hundred came, you better believe they also left. But that was it. And so here they're into this. So what began to happen? There were people who began to understand. Pastor Mitchell took a hard stand. He said, this is not God. It will cause destruction. It wind up causing massive destruction in the assembly of God from this. But this was what God began to use One of the the five leaders, he made a number of foolish decisions in his home church, lost credibility. He had to wind up resigning. Another of these uh, men, uh, the one that would not have Pastor Mitchell come and preach for him, some of his own pastors began to speak out about his abuse. And finally, a board of elders meeting was called to address this. And at the end of it, it was clear by his attitude, his treatment of people, the board of elders asked him to resign. They were willing to allow him to pioneer, do something else, but he's way beyond pioneering. He refused, and so he pulled out of the fellowship. His obstructionist twin in Santa Fe also pulled out at the same time. Their buddy in Gallup, New Mexico, wanted to, but he lacked courage. And so he stalled and waited and actually resigned. And thank God Tom Payne was able to take Gallup, New Mexico and save that church. But there was residual damage. I described this before. Always when you do that, some of their pastors, some of their churches joined this. We lost three conference churches. We lost probably in the neighborhood of 95 uh, churches I have from my father's Bible I have a picture here I want you to see this is my dad's Bible September 6th of 2000 and here he writes the names of these men Coolidge Johnson Houghton Maston these were ringleaders of the 2000 rebellion and uh, uh, he is uh, speaking here my mouth is enlarged over my enemies these men they became enemies they did all they could to destroy the uh, uh, fellowship. Ultimately, one of the men on the screen there, that he came to start a church in Prescott Valley. He used to be the assistant here. And remember, I said about rebellion is fed by pride. He and his wife said, we built the Prescott Church. And I want to tell you, that's a special kind of delusional. That, That was their opinion, and they thought... By them coming and starting a church in Prescott Valley, they were going to clean out the church and they were going to rise to uh, great heights. Another picture I want to show you out of my dad's Bible is here. Uh, November of 2001, about the time he was starting this church, is God spoke to him, it shall not stand. And this came to pass. He, He stayed for a few years, drew only a few people, and then that church Fizzled out, one more photo from my dad's Bible is here. 
there was no day like it before and after it that the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man, but especially the last line, for the Lord fought for Israel. And he writes that man's name, Johnson, August of 2003. And dad applied that to the Prescott Church is God did not allow the Prescott Church to uh, uh, be destroyed. What was very sad, this man used to be the assistant here, is looking back through the years, for many years, there would be people that would just suddenly leave the church. And after this rebellion, looking back, dad and I were able to pinpoint Somewhere along the line, they had connection with this man when he was the assistant. Because even since I started this series, I've had people come and say, you know what he told me one time? He lied and he poisoned and just dropped things against Pastor Mitchell and against the fellowship. What a legacy. How would you like that to be your legacy? Dr. Death, everyone who came in contact with him, he did damage to them. And now he's a -a rent-a-rebel is every time we have somebody who winds up leaving the fellowship, you can bet he'll be preaching there in a few weeks. Uh, How sad, a man who used to build for God, now that's his legacy, is trying to do damage and destruction. Here's a lesson. This lesson was suggested by Pastor Mark Olson. He said, Greg, you need to have a lesson. WWD, what would Wayman do? And what he's talking about is, how should you react? How should you react when things don't do right, go right? How should you act in life? How should, what would your reaction be when people betray you, when people try and harm the work of God? 2,000. Now we have a split. We're losing, you know, as I said, roughly around 95 churches uh, or so. Joe Campbell and Mark Olson, Joe Campbell pastors in Chandler, just uh, down in the valley, Mark Olson in in Tempe, down in the valley. Joe Campbell said to Mark Olson, let's go encourage Pastor Mitchell. So they called and said, let's let's go to lunch. And uh, they drove up here to Prescott and meet with him. I want to put the quote that Mark Olson uh, wrote down for me. Mark Olson said, the second he, that's Pastor Mitchell, saw us, he said, I don't know what you're going to do, Campbell. And I don't know what you're going to do, Olson, but I'm going to plant churches. And they said, yes. So what would Wayman do? What do you do when things are not going well? You stick to what God told you. That's what you do. You don't change your mind. And regardless of circumstances, that's exactly what Pastor Mitchell did. I described to you in 1990 when he was blindsided temporarily He was rocked and and thought about not doing it, but never again was he ever like that. Is when there was a problem, he said, we are going to do the will of God, and we're not stopping. I don't care what people say. God told us what to do. And he said, that is what would Wayman do. The highest lesson that we take, and we'll move on now to something better in just a minute. The highest lesson from the split of 2000 is you have to keep your heart right. You got to keep your heart right when things are bad, when things are good. Number one, you need to maintain gratitude because gratitude is protective. Number two, we need to maintain humility. You know what it means to be humble? Humble doesn't mean, I don't know why they asked me to sing. I can't really sing. Then sit down, we'll get somebody else. That's not, that's not humility. Humility is just simply honest recognition of the facts. Are you succeeding? Are you doing great? Okay, you owe God and your pastor, and the people in your church, and in the fellowship, that will keep you. You know, it's amazing. Some of these men that I just put their names up, they were fellowship rock stars at one point in time. They preached all the conferences. Everybody knew their name. We are the fellowship. I must confess, I, I chuckle every single time we're having breakfast. Every once in a while, one of their names comes up, and someone will make a comment about them. And numbers of people at the table will go, who? (laughs) And I laugh. (laughs) Like, oh yeah, we are the fellowship. There There are thousands of people who have no idea who they are. Because that is the truth about pride. You think you're hot, God will bring you low. And you you think you're indispensable, stick your arm in a bucket of water, pull it out, and the hole that's left, that's how much you're going to be missed. 
That's the real truth of life. Now let's move on to something better. Let's talk about Chinle and the Navajo Nation. A worker, as we said in earlier lesson, was sent to Chinle uh, around 1975. And uh, actually, I was uh, speaking about Gallup, but uh, the first worker was sent, not from Prescott, but was sent to Chinle around 1975. We actually have some photos. Uh, here was a man, he was sent from Colorado, if I remember right. Uh, he was the original pastor. I have a picture of the original building in Chin Lee. That is the original building that they ever had. That building was built by Ike Cook, uh, Greg Malinowski, some of the men from the church, Bob Allen. There were a few, I, and they went and built that building there. 1980, Glenn Cluck, Glenn and Donna Cluck took over the church in Chin Lee, and they pastored from 80 to 83. We have some pictures of the Clucks. Here, they had a tent to, uh, that they used to uh, have a, a campaign every year. The next pastor who took Chin Lee from uh, the Klux in 1990 was part of the original rebellion and left. And uh, they had no uh, church. Actually, it was before 90. But uh, there was no church there for, uh, for years. April of 1992, four ladies from Chin Lee came to the Gallup Conference to talk to Pastor Mitchell, and they asked Pastor Mitchell, please, would you plant a church in Chin Lee? I got a, have a photo here. These four ladies, these precious ladies, there was no fellowship church. They said, Pastor Mitchell, please, plant a church in Chinle, and Pastor Mitchell told them in April of 92, we have no man, man to send there. They came back in October, and they told Pastor Mitchell, we found a man, you just need to send him. <laughs> who did they have in mind? Artie Aragon, who was assisting in Gallup, New Mexico. And so, because of those ladies' persistence, Pastor Mitchell approached Artie and said, are you willing to go to Chin Lee? And uh, Artie, uh, he always tells me this, Pastor Mitchell said, I need a five-year commitment. You're going to stay for five years. That was in 1990. He's still there. <laughs> Artie says, I was tricked. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, what he did, and he went to Chinle says when they arrived, there was no building. Remember, the building that we built, they stole that, and uh, the man who left the fellowship stole that. Uh, they kept it, so they had to meet in a classroom in the old kindergarten center for two to three months. Finally, one of the ladies gave them a house so they could have a church. Lorraine Hardy gave them a house to use for church. He said, the house you could have eight chairs across and six chairs, chairs deep. There was no restroom in that house. If people needed to use the bathroom, the restroom, they had to go to a, a gas station or a nearby store. And where that building was is uh, the, where the current restrooms in the building. Artie tells, uh, you, you cannot grasp unless you've been to Chinle even today after all these years but going when he first went how difficult it was to live there you're faced with the the brokenness and the poverty everything you need to buy you can't buy it in Chinle you have to travel uh, out of there but Artie and Sandra Aragon took over there began to love those people and Artie began to preach the gospel he began to preach hope and the power to change, and God began to save Navajos. Chinle, for those who are watching, you don't know what this is. This is a reservation area uh, in Arizona, uh, Navajo Reservation. Navajos started getting saved, and they started changing. Powerful conversions. God was doing miracles in people's lives, and it established a testimony. It's a very small place when someone would get delivered from drugs and alcohol, very soon everybody knew about it. And uh, in a place where alcohol and drugs and suicide, domestic abuse are, are rampant, 
Artie and Sandra just preached the gospel, ministered and loved people. One of the things that, about Artie's ministry there is funerals. Artie has done over 400 funerals since he has uh, been there. He says, I'm teaching this in November of 2023, he says he's already done 51 funerals this year. Just in, an incredible uh, need, but the church in Chinle has uh, become a, a, a resource of blessing for the whole community. I want you to see the pictures of the building here. That was the, in the original old building, move on. Uh, now, this is the outside of the building that they have now on the inside. I want to tell you, that's probably the nicest building in Chinle. It is beautiful. Artie Aragon is a craftsman. Everything is beautiful in that building. It gives dignity to the people. One of the things about Artie and the uh, Chinle boys, the Navajo boys, they started coming when we started using the tent. The first time we used the tent, we used a company. They didn't even know how to set it up correctly. And so Ike Cook uh, had to help them, but he needed help setting it up. The Navajo boys started coming with Artie to help us uh, uh, set up. Originally, we would have a whole bunch of guys from everywhere come, but pretty soon, the boys from Chinle got so good at it, they basically did all the work. And they had it done. By the time we arrived to help, they had most of it done. And uh, from 1990 until 2019, the last time we had the tent, uh, January of 2019, is there were always, you see here, that was the crew that came. They would work their butts off, tremendous workers. They would clean out Golden Corral, the buffet. The <laughs> profits of Golden Corral plummeted every time they came. The locusts came and devoured everything in sight. But they were a blessing to uh, Ike Cook and the Prescott congregation. We owed them a, a great deal for that. One of the powerful things that already started doing in Chinle started making disciples, getting converts powerfully saved, but now he believed in the Navajos. He believed that natives could become powerful men of God. 1999, they sent out their first church. Sean and Hope Haven went to Cayenta, uh, 50 miles away. And you have to understand, to plant churches on reservations, often it's a greater challenge because there are no buildings. It's not, there's, there's no buildings to rent. There's no housing. If you're not a, 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 from there, you can't get one. So to plant a church, they often they had to buy a mobile home for the pastor to live in. Sometimes they had to buy a mobile home for the church to uh, meet in. And often, it, sometimes they'd get a house or an old abandoned building. Every time they plant a church, it involves a major building project that Artie has uh, uh, gotten involved in. They planted other churches in the Navajo Nation. Martin and Dina Haven in Fort Defiance, Arizona. Now we'll show you some pictures of these. This is the building and I'm, in each of them, I'll show you the, the, the couple, the family and their church. That's Fort Defiance. Next one, Dan and Pam Lee are now in uh, Cayenta, Arizona. That's their building. Miller and Charity Deadman, pastoring in Winslow, the church that we originally uh, sent a worker there, and here is the church in Winslow today. Dempsey and Cheryl Deswood are in Tuba City, Arizona. That is half Navajo, half Hopi, very unique uh, place in the world. Kevin and Corinda Gray in Payson, Arizona. Uh, after uh, Brother Hart uh, did a crusade, got some people saved, and there is the church in Payson, Arizona. But what God began to do is not only are they planting churches, but now the word spread of what God was doing in Chin Li and people in other cities, in other reservations, even other tribes, they wanted a church to be planted. Cuba, New Mexico, a lady who used to be in the Santa Fe church, Nancy Baca, she donated a building. She wanted there to be uh, Potter's House Church in Cuba, New Mexico. So she uh, uh, donated the building we have here. This is Nina or Adam and uh, Nia uh, Braxton, Nia Braxton, who uh, were pastoring there. They've uh, moved on since there. That's Cuba, New Mexico, Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Now this is far away. People in Pine Ridge 
contacted Artie because they heard that there is hope. They heard in the, in the, in the incredible problems on the reservation is that Artie was preaching hope, people were changing, and they said, please, come plant a church in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Here's Patrick and uh, Lauren Ashley, Shaz Ashley, is uh, they are there in Pine Ridge, Rapid City, South Dakota. Chris and Erica Morgan uh, are there, and you'll notice both of these are daughters of uh, Artie, uh, who married uh, Navajo boys, are now pastoring, and that's in Rapid City, South Dakota, even internationally, the word would spread not just within the United States, but internationally. Artie was preaching in Saskatoon, in Saskatchewan, in Canada, and there they called natives First Nation. Some First Nation people came and they said, please, would you come and plant a worker here? And so Derek and Audrey Clouchy uh, went there in the town there in, in Saskatoon. There are approximately 30,000 Natives, and so they planted from Chinle. They planted into uh, Canada, and Chinle has planted other churches internationally. Winnipeg in Manitoba in Canada. Elijah and Anna Pete, next photo there, uh, are in uh, Winnipeg. Approximately 90,000 natives live in Winnipeg. But then they planted a church into Shanghai, China. And from Chinle, Donnie and Trissy Benali pioneered it. This was the first Navajo couple sent overseas from Chinle. There they are in Shanghai, China. There are some of their converts. That church is ongoing uh, to this day. Donnie passed away from COVID in uh, 2020. But that couple you see in the bottom right-hand corner, Martin and Jane Ma Wei, they took it over, are pastoring a church that was pioneered from Chinle, Arizona, doing a work for God there. And in October of 2023, just last month, out of the Gallup congregation, uh, they announced going into Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, is uh, Adam and Naya Braxton. They're going to Ho Chi Minh City. And so one of the things that God has done that is very powerful is... Because of the incredible need in Chinle, there, the suicide rate and, and just alcohol and drug uh, uh, addiction rates. Siri, shut up here. And Siri said, okay, see, she listens. Uh, but one, one of the very powerful things that has happened, because the testimony is so powerful, it has given them favor with uh, officials. We have some pictures here. The first picture here is the, this is the mayor of Chinle, what they call the chapter house president. And uh, these people will come to church because they know the testimony there. Next photo, uh, let's see here. This is the former president of the Navajo Nation, Joe Shirley. Junior, uh, he was the president from 2003 to 2011, came to a camp meeting, and here the Chinle pastors are laying hands on the president. He came because of the testimony that he knew. The next uh, picture, here is uh, former president Jonathan Nez from 2019 to 2023. Uh, he came to a regular Sunday night service. He would attend events from time to time. And uh, Artie said uh, he had his personal phone number, was given essential business privileges during the COVID uh, nonsense of, of 2020. And the final picture is the acting president, uh, Boo Nigran, I guess is how you say it. He came to the camp meeting in 2023, spent two hours after the service talking with uh, the the, uh, also, the Navajo Nation Speaker of the House also came. And so, n normally our, our thing is we don't, we don't glory in the fact that politicians come. The only reason why that is impressive, the politicians came because of the testimony. It's not seeking out like we want somebody famous coming to our church. I'm telling you the work that Artie and Sandra have done in Chinle and the work that they are doing, raising up disciples, Artie gets invitations from many different uh, tribes all across America 
even, as I said, in Canada, other nations, that they want him to come because the testimony of what God has done, God has done a miracle in Chinle. And we rejoice, we thank God for Artie and Sandra and the Chinle Church. We are glad that they're a part of our current. Let's praise God and thank God for what he's done. God, we are grateful for your goodness, Lord God. And that is so impressive is when people will simply do what we do. It works everywhere. Doesn't matter what the, the type of people, doesn't matter the background of the people, what we do in our fellowship, if you'll just evangelize, preach the gospel, raise up workers, it will work. And then it is so impressive that there were people who said, we want what the fellowship has. And those ladies, God bless them, numbers of them are gone on to be with the Lord. But the legacy that those four ladies that we had on the screen, because they wanted, listen, in our fellowship, the people, you are powerful. I want you to understand that. If you have a heart, you want to do right, God can use you. We are reaching the world because of people just like you. And that is one of the great things I want you to see in all these lessons. I say again, our fellowship is not a work of man, it's a work of God. Can you say amen? God bless you. We'll stop there and the service will start at 1030.